Hello fellow modelers, uh, Bruce here again. Um, I thought I would do a short video, hopefully it's going to be short, on uh, how I would go about scratch building a king post bridge out of wood. Um, when I did my first king post bridge, I had actually found plans, detailed plans, on the website of the Tennessee uh, Department of Transportation. When I went searching for that again, um, I found that uh, with their new and improved website, they didn't devote any uh, space to these old plans for old-fashioned bridges. But uh, at any rate, I have this existing bridge to use as an example. And there are really three major components to the bridge. There's the underframe, um, which consists of three cross pieces and then a bunch of joists on top. And the second component would be the truss, which is one for each side of the bridge. And the uh, third component is the wooden railing or guardrail on the side of the bridge. The only other thing you have to build is this angle support, which once you get everything else assembled, uh, you can take the measurements right from the model as far as cutting that out. Now on this bridge, because it was going to be for vehicular tra uh, traffic, on top of the trusses where you see these a bunch of these cross members here, uh, those are supporting the decking on this model. But on the one I'm going to make, which is going to have a railroad going across it, the cross members are going to be railroad ties. And there will be no decking other than maybe a walkway on each side beyond the tracks. I had mentioned in another video that I had built this one initially on my old layout for vehicles. And although you can fit uh, HO scale track on there, uh, the clearance when you put a locomotive in place, give you an idea, here's a HO scale locomotive, uh, gets pretty darn tight. And so I am making the uh, new bridge wider and also a little bit longer. So how do I go about scratch building? Well, the first thing I do is take a clean piece of paper and begin drawing the layout of where I want to put strips of wood. And the only tool I needed was a square and a uh, HO scale rule. So I determined from actually measuring the width of my stream that I wanted to have the bridge to be 32 feet long, which is a couple feet longer than the existing uh, bridge that I had made previously. And I want it to be 15 feet wide instead of the 13 feet wide that the original bridge was. So now I've just drawn lines where I want the uh, three cross members to go, which will be the first things I glue down, and then the place where uh, all of the joists are going to go. And what I've done here is uh, taken a uh, tip from this kit, which was for a uh, queen post bridge, that under the rails they actually had three joists or pretty close together. So you will see here that I have a total of uh, three under where the rails are going to be. They would be about six inches apart and another three where this rail is going to be. The center one is exactly where the rail is going. And then uh, a couple of other uh, longitudinal joists as well. The uh, So that's the base thing. So you, you glue the three cross members and uh, they're going to be 15 feet wide and then you glue uh, all of the joists on and those are going to be 32 feet long. And uh, once that's dry then you might be able to see, especially if I zero in, I've put dots on my plans where 
every railroad tie will be. Now I'll later draw in these verticals, but I didn't want to do that here and, and make it look so messy for you to see. So it'll be 15 railroad ties on that bridge. And I uh, just put some double-sided tape down and I start gluing right on this surface. I extend the lines beyond the uh, dimensions of the, the bridge itself. You can see that my lines extend beyond both here and on the top and bottom. And that's so I can line the wood up uh, with those. If, if you only made it to line up with these uh, cross pieces, you wouldn't, your, your piece of wood is hiding this line. You don't know whether you're putting them crooked or not, but by extending them you can see it. So that's the base. Above the base, I've drawn the picture for the fence. I have to make two of those. And again, the fence actually goes from this bottom line up to the top of this uh, rail right here. I've extended these lines beyond so that you can, uh, uh, again, see for lining up. I did not do that with the uh, side rails here because in this case I'm going to actually line the, uh, the rail, the railing itself, with the, uh, the top of the railing will be right against that line and the top of the railing will be right against the bottom line. So I got two of those and then if you swing over here the only other assembly really is the uh, truss itself, uh, 32 feet long, 8.5 feet high. I'm just going to glue this piece and this piece together. I'll cut these right in place on top of here so these angles and these angles are going to be fine. I'll glue two of those and then after the base over here is done you can glue it over. So I'll come back again when I start gluing and uh, determine the exact dimensions of all the lumber I'm going to use which I'll list out for you. Alright, see you then. Okay, after you have drawn your diagrams, as we talked about in the first part of this video, the next step really is to um, pick out all your lumber and prepare it so that when you start gluing you don't have to stop the process and go get another piece of lumber. Um, <clears throat> two types of lumber I build with. Uh, all of it is, uh, you know, made for modelers, but uh, part of it is what I call scale dimensional lumber, so an HO scale, it would be an HO scale 2x4, an HO scale 4x8, uh, so that's dimensional lumber. And then the other is fractional lumber, so it's sold as uh, uh, 1 32nd by an eighth or uh, 3 16 by a half, so in other words it's giving it to you in real world fractional dimensions. So what comes in handy is to, <clears throat> just one time in the beginning when you start the scratch build, make yourself a little chart like this, which shows the conversion between the real fractional units and the HO scale in inches. So 1 32nd of an inch is about 2.7 inches in HO scale. Uh, 3 64ths is 4.1 inches and so forth. So you can see this chart is converting a real fraction, 5 sixty-fourths of an inch, into HO scale, 6.8 inches. So once you have that, you know if you really want to build with, let's say, a 3 by 4 the closest you're going to get in fractional lumber would be a piece of strip wood that's 1 32nd by 3 64ths, which would be 2.7 inches by 4.1. So, uh, to the naked eye, unless you're matching it up against a scale uh, 3 by 4 you would never notice the difference. So, you know, when do I use dimensional lumber and when do I use fractional? If I'm building a structure, normally, normally, I use um, scale dimensional lumber. But if I'm doing something like this bridge, uh, I tend to come over here and use the fractional lumber. And the uh, thing is, that's a lot cheaper. It uh, comes in two foot lengths, so that's what I order. Plenty of places to get it. Micromark has a good selection of uh, fractional lumber. So, okay, that's my chart. You only have to make that once. 
if you don't lose it, I've taken pictures of it, so if I do lose it, I'm still in good shape. The next thing to do is decide for your job what you want to have uh, done. Let me just put this here so I can put this at an angle. It might be easier for you to see. Then again, maybe it won't work. Let's see. Okay. So, I decided, and this is pretty much by taking dimensions from the previous two bridges that I've shown you, the king post and the queen post, that uh, all the underframe, the cross beams, the base cross beams, the joists, and even the truss were eight, eight by tens. And that's if you use dimensional lumber. Fractional lumber would be 3 30 seconds by an eighth would be the closest thing to it. 3 30 seconds by an eighth would be 8.2 inches by 11 inches. So I'm going to uh, use that for all of my, uh, basically all my framing. Uh, the ties, well, I want to match the ties on, uh, you know, prepared track with the fake ties. Because what I'm going to do when it comes to the bridge on my flex track is just remove a bunch of these ties and replace it with wooden ties. So I want ties that are somewhat this shape. Now that's not the shape of the ties I use if I'm laying, hand laying track um, right from scratch. There I buy scale railroad ties, but these, um, the closest thing to them are six by tens. And uh, in fractional lumber would be uh, one sixteenth by an eighth. And in a minute when I'm done with this chart, I'll show you how close that is to these fake ties. For the fence on the side, um, in dimensional lumber, they were three by sixes, and I'm going to use uh, one thirty-second by an eighth. And for the walkway on either side of the um, track, uh, three by tens, which are one thirty-second by an eighth. So that's my my lumber that I'm going to prepare for this job. All right, let me uh, show you how close the ties are, the 1 16th by an 8th. So they, as I told you, they come in um, two foot lengths. So this is the 1 16th by an 8th package. I'll take one out. And let me move this back a bit so you can maybe see it maybe from an angle. First of all, let's look at the width. So if you put that next to one of those fake ties, you can see it's just about the same width. And in terms of height, if I put put this between there, that's pretty much flush. So these will look like the ties that are on the flex track as it comes across the uh, across the bridge. So I'm going to use this as the ties. And again, this is not the shape of commercial railroad ties. Uh, if I was uh, hand laying track. All right, so I've chosen all my lumber. Uh, I do a couple things first, you know, before I start gluing, certainly. And the first thing is, and again, let me move this uh, back a little bit so I can get to where I can work. The first thing I do well, before I do any cutting is to take a very fine razor saw and I run it across the, uh, the wood on both sides once or twice in each case and that's going to put uh, wood grain into what otherwise would be very smooth uh, wood. You can also do it on the ends when you get something as, as thick as this on the side edges of the, of the wood. So I'm going to take all my pieces before cutting and do that. That tends to raise a bit of um, wood fluff, and so I take a very, very, very fine um, paper, uh, sandpaper, and I get rid of all that fluff. The next thing I'm going to do is, using a chopper, is cut all my wood to the lengths that I'm showing on my di diagram that we made in the last uh, part of the movie. And then finally, I'm going to stain my wood to look like aged or creosoted wood. 
And the best way to do that is to take a container like this, which is an old Q-tip container. And I use a mixture of 91% uh, isopropyl alcohol. I leave it right in the uh, one pint jar and I add two teaspoons of um, India ink and shake it up. I'll pour that into this basin and I'll throw all my wood in, leave it in for about a half an hour and then pick that wood out with a pair of tweezers and lay it on some uh, wax paper to dry. Once all of that's done, then I start my gluing. So I'm going to go do all of that off camera and then I'll be back and I'll show you some of the gluing process. Talk to you then. The uh, first thing I am going to do, I've stained the wood and it's dried. Over here is the uh, diagram for the base and I've added the lines now for the uh, railroad ties that we'll be adding later so it's gotten to be a bit more confusing of a, uh, of a diagram. When I build, I build right on top of here. To hold the wood in place, I use double-sided tape. It's just regular Scotch 3M uh, double-sided tape. It says it's permanent, but I use it because it's the least aggressive. And uh, it's only going to hold some wood in place while I glue it, and then I want to be able to remove that wood off of the tape, so I don't want something more aggressive than this. So I always have this in stock. And when I put it down, I'm going to use it to hold the uh, cross members here, the three cross members, the, each one for, one for each end and one for the center. You can see the center one is wider. It's actually six feet wider. It extends beyond the sides of the bridge by three feet on each side in the center, and that's where that angle brace goes on to the joist, uh, to the uh, side beams. So you, excuse me, the trusses finally came into my mind. So I'm putting a little bit of tape on each end of the uh, line for where these cr uh, cross members are going to go. The end of these here, here, here. I don't put a whole strip. I don't put it this way. It's going to hold it down too aggressively. Just take a little piece, cut it off, and put it near where the end of the wood is that I want to hold in place. So now I have one for each end and I'm going to put it in place here and these were lined up so that you got a line just at the edge of the cross member and that's being held now in place by that glue the center one, again, I have a, a mark here. This one, I make the line go down the center of the board. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the last one again. that goes along the edge of the line. Okay, so I have those in place. I am going to check that they are perpendicular to the uh, joist by bringing my square in and then putting that well in place. Oops. I want these to be all properly aligned to begin with because that's going to be the base of your bridge. Okay, so those are in there. Now I'm going to take the 32 foot long timbers and I'm going to glue them in 
just three places here. You line it up with the outside edge of that and the outside edge. So three little dots of glue. And then you start working your way down. Now the way I glue, and I think I mentioned this before, is I never take well, first of all, my favorite glue for wood on wood is uh, Aileen's Tacky Glue. But you never take it and just put a big blob of it right out of the uh, glue container. I have this uh, shiny paper, like it's on the back of postage stamps and a lot of other things. I put a dab of it down on that. And I save that in a, uh, actually it's a peanut butter glass plastic that keeps the glue down at the end I want it on and then I pick up a dab and I put it on the surface with a toothpick so I just want a little dab on the end of each of these it makes for a lot cleaner joints without so much glue hanging around uh, which really makes your model look messy. It's extremely important if you're building a contest model because you really get dinged points for uh, having glue showing. Okay, so now I get these laying down right where I want them. Press down. Now some glue did ooze out and I keep a clean toothpick around for that and I just pick that glue off right away before it has a chance to uh, set. When that, everything dries now you're going to have a nice joint that uh, you'll see no excess glue on. So just press it down for a few seconds just going to make sure that it's not extending beyond the edge on either end. There it is. Just a little bit of weight. doesn't take much and not for too long anyway. And that's why I like the tacky glue because it gets tacky right away and holds it in place. And I'll just work my way down. I'll come back when I start putting the uh, railroad ties on. So I'll talk to you then. All right, this is uh, just literally about 25 minutes later. And uh, the cross members are down on the tape, as you saw. And now the uh, joists are all glued to those three cross members. You remember I was going to put uh, right where the rails go. There's three beams very close together on either side, and they would be right underneath the rails. And there's room on each side for walkway. Give me more clearance compared to the old bridge. The next thing up is going to be to glue the ties in place where I want them. They go to full, full width, and if you recall, I wanted them to be pretty much the same width as these ties so it looked all right um, as it crossed the, uh, the bridge because I'm going to have flex track on either side. Um, yeah, so it's going quickly. Um, it's about lunchtime now so I'll probably stop. After I uh, glued uh, three or so in place I would uh, just put some weight on them for uh, a minute or two, uh, let them glue down and then proceed. So it goes fairly quickly. So that's where we are right now. Uh, time to, to glue the ties on next. Talk to you later. Okay, a couple of uh, scratch building tips here that I'd insert. I do have the uh, ties now glued on to the joists. And uh, one tip is how do you get them spaced good? I do have the lines drawn and you can try to center each line on the tie that you're gluing. But another tip is to find something to act as a spacer. So once you get the first one down, then you can use your spacer to get all the rest of them lined up. And I looked at the, uh, 
distance between the ties on this piece of uh, flex track. And I found that a 12 inch scale, um, HO scale board uh, fit in there. So I just, you know, looked through my stash and tried a few different things and said, okay, which is, which is going to just be a nice fit in between those ties. And it turns out that a uh, 12 inch wide scale board did the trick. So I took a piece of uh, 10 by 12, uh, glued the first one in, put this down, you know, put my glue down on the joist, tuck that next tie right up tight against it, move to the next one and so forth. So that's, uh, that's a tip. You can do it by eye, but if you can find something to act as a spacer, it's a, a real godsend. Next, once you uh, have glued it and you look at it, you notice that there's a, uh, a couple of the ties that are a lot lighter than the others. Now, you know, it's all basswood. All actually came out of the same package, but different strips. And different strips are cut from either different logs initially or from different parts of the log, but it takes the stain differently. And uh, sometimes that kind of variation isn't a bad thing, but when it comes to railroad ties, if you've ever walked along a railroad, you don't see uh, much of a variation unless it's uh, you're comparing a new tie to an old tie. So uh, about three years ago, uh, when I was building a uh, fine scale miniature coaling station, I did a short video on uh, coloring aged wood using a uh, combination approach of staining it in alcohol and India ink and then using Prismacolor markers Prismacolor markers in the cool gray line. So all of this package of markers, and I have loads of Prismacolor markers, but all the ones in this package are cool gray, starting with cool gray 20% up to about 80%. And uh, so what you can do is you can use different intensities of the cool gray. And here I have a cool gray 40 and a cool gray 30 uh, marker to even those colors out. So for instance, the first two ties that you see here, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit on it. The first two ties were one of these dark ties like this one and one of these light ties like this one. And what I did was I went over, first of all, the light tie with a cool gray 40% intensity and uh, got it to this color. And then to make these two even look closer, I went over the darker one that, that was originally darker with the cool gray 30%. So if you look, and this is a real quick uh, task to do, if you look at the next three ties in a row here, they're all of the darker color. And I'll just go over them with my cool gray 30. And don't panic if it looks a little too dark in the beginning because it always dries uh, cooler. And the next one is a light tie. So I'm gonna go over that with a cool gray 40. Now I just started with 30 and 40. If the uh, 40 had not been uh, dark enough, I would have gone to uh, a 50. So here's the cool gray 40. And now you're starting to get, when this one dries, you'll see it, you're starting to get ties that are very close uh, together. Okay, last item before I uh, turn off the video and go back to work. I've glued uh, one of the trusses together over, over here. And it's, it's kind of like gluing an end cut to an end cut. Yeah, it's at an angle there, but still, um, that's a fragile connection there. And I use the Aileen's Tacky Glue. The uh, whole thing is held down with three pieces of uh, double-sided tape, as I explained. But that joint is weak. Uh, it'll be supported later once I glue it in place by the railing and so forth. But I am going to have to drill straight down through that joint for this... Uh, threaded rod, threaded rod, that, uh, you know, kind of holds everything together. So I want that joint to be, 
a little more stable. So here's a trick for strengthening end butted glues like that. Take just a, a little bit of super glue, just a little tiny puddle. Sometimes I put it on wax paper. Here I'm putting it on the shiny paper. Uh, my usual, by the way, my usual brand of super glue is a Loctite. But uh, I had seen a modeler really from, I think it was from England, who really recommended this uh, super glue, and I was able to get some. It's uh, super strong, he says. All right, so my favorite way of uh, applying super glue is with a uh, sewing pin locked into my little pin vise, and I just pick up a drop and I just come down and hold it on that joint and the super glue will wick into the joint. Come in from below here too a little bit. And that's it. That will, when it's dry, strengthen that joint significantly. Um, I will show you how I peel these back up in a minute, but I want everything to dry. But you have to be careful, obviously, with these because uh, it's very fragile when you have this until you get everything glued together. So what you don't do is you don't come in and pick it up and try to pry it. You come in with a razor blade and you try to come underneath very carefully and loosen each of the joints off of the double-sided tape. And once you get them all loose, then you can remove it, set it aside. I have to make one more of these. Eventually they will become the main truss on the king post bridge. Uh, they'll be glued in position here and here. But I have to make one more of these. So I'm setting this aside right now so my clumsy fingers don't break it. Okay, talk to you soon. Well, here's all the components of the king post bridge. Um, made up and ready for assembly. These are a couple of uh, guardrails that will go right along the edge of the walkway here. Um, the two railings and the trusses, the bridge itself, and I've removed the center ties here from this piece of track that will be attached to the, uh, to the decking. So now it's, it's time for assembly, and the order I'll do it in is first to spike down the, the section of rail onto the bridge, then uh, put on the guardrails, then glue on the railings, and on the outside of the railings you put the two trusses. And after that's all dry, you're going to have to drill a hole down through the top of the truss. There's already a hole drilled in each of these extensions here and here and we put the uh, uh, metal rod that uh, is really is the support that pulls this up against the, uh, the trusses. So that's the next step. See you then. Okay, a uh, little update. I'm not going to show you the entire assembly of these uh, components for the bridge, but I did want to show you how I attach rail to the wooden ties on something like this, where I've removed the uh, commercial ties, the plastic ties, off of here, and I'm going to run it across the bridge. Um, for that purpose, I start by using Walther's Goo. Now, I don't use Walther's Goo for much, but I always use it for this particular application, where I put a very thin layer. This is really sticky, gooey stuff. Um, a very thin layer along the rail, like you see I did on that other rail. And it just likes to leave big strings hanging off of it. So you don't want to put too much on. Um, this is going to hold those rails in place. Probably it's all I would need to use, but uh, I come back and I put some spikes in just for looks more than anything else. And uh, I'm not going to show you me spiking it, but I will typically drill undersized holes wherever I'm going to put a spike after right next to the rail. 
and then come back with my pliers and insert the spikes. All right, so I got the goo on the bottom. Now I want to line up the rail, and I'm lining it up with the uh, one of the joists underneath, the one that's in the middle of the other two. Okay. Now, the other thing you want to do is make sure that the rails stay in, in uh, gauge here. And for that, they sell these uh, triangular track gauges, which are sold by the scale, so you want HO in my case, uh, and then by the size of the rail. So this is HO 100. So, you know, I have code 100 track here, so I want an HO 100. And you put on the bottom, there's three slides that keep everything right into gauge. You get it on until it slides nice. And I'm pressing down now because I'm trying to get the goo to make good contact the whole way and keep the rails engaged at the same time. Now, I pre-weathered these uh, this section of track using the technique that I showed in one of my YouTube videos. If I remember, I'll put a link in it, but otherwise you can just search my videos for weathering track. And uh, much easier to do it ahead of time because once the sides are up on this, you can't even get to it. Okay, and that's down pretty good. Now here's what I do. I take a preheated soldering iron and I want to heat up the track, and that will heat up the goo and let it somewhat run a little bit. See it running now. I'll do this one here. When I'm done with this, I'll run that track gauge along it again and press down. You can see goo oozing out a little bit. All right, and I will check once more that they're lined up on. The joist that I want them lined up on, which it is. One of these always does slide better than the other. Got a little coating of solder on top of the rails, which I will get off by scraping here. So my soldering iron still had some remnants, but there, that cleaned it right off. All right, and that's it. So right now that's uh, in place until I want to tack them down. I'm gonna go for lunch anyway, so I'm just gonna put some weight on them here and that's it. Okay, talk to you soon. So there we have it. King Post Bridge. Built in about, oh, I would say six hours of modeling time. Maybe, maybe a little more, but I'm a slow modeler. The uh, only things besides the wood that I needed here were some wire for the uh, uh, rod supports that uh, go up to the truss, and I have the K&S. Uh, let's see if we can get that to focus. Probably not here. K&S uh, .025 wire. I always have on hand a couple of different diameters, and some nut bolt washer castings from Grantline that I put on top of. Uh, the truss on each side. 
So you can just see those. Other than that, it's just a, from a pile of wood, a bunch of sticks to a bridge and a few easy modeling sessions. Hope you enjoyed it. Give it a try. As always, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a like. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the channel.